to the My Horse University and Extension Horse Quest live webcast on horse boarding operations. We're excited to have you all here tonight, and I think we are going to have a rather large crowd. Our presenter this evening is Kristen Wilson from University of Maryland Extension. Kristen earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Science, Equine Industry with a minor in Agriculture Business from the University of Florida in 2003. She remained at University of Florida to earn a Master's degree in Extension Education with a minor in Youth Development in 2005. As the Extension Horse Specialist for University of Maryland Extension, Kristen provides a statewide leadership for the Maryland 4-H Horse Program by coordinating statewide equine contests and educational programs for 4-Hers, volunteers, and county educators. In addition, she teaches within the Institute of Applied Agriculture's Equine Business Management Program. She is also active in showing Tennessee walking horses at the national level and recently received six national championships in 2011 with her mare. Please note that you're able to ask questions during the presentation using the text chat on the left of your screen. Questions tonight will be answered throughout the presentation by Jennifer Reynolds, um, the Extension Coordinator at University of Maryland, and we'll also have some time for questions at the end of the presentation. Our webcast tonight will be recorded and uploaded to our website, myhorseuniversity.com, um, by the end of the week if you'd like to review it at a later date. And at this time, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to Kristen. Good evening, all. It's exciting to see so many people on this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and advance through some of these slides. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about horse boarding businesses and all that is involved in it. Um, as um, was indicated, if you do have questions, since we do have such a large group, feel free to put them in the um, chat box and Jennifer Reynolds will be happy to answer those as we go through. Um, and then we should also have time at the end for questions. Um, so I just wanted to start off by giving a little bit of an overview of what we currently have here in the U.S. horse industry. Most of you being horse people probably know this, um, but the American Horse Council in 2005 did a study and they um, valued the goods and services related to the horse industry at almost $40 billion. Um, these goods and services create a market for several services such as vets, farriers, training, breeders, um, and of course horse boarding operations. So it shows you that there is an industry there that has um, needs and services to be offered to them. Um, our U.S. horse industry as of 2005 also offers 460, um, 46. 4,600, sorry, um, full-time equivalent jobs annually. Um, we have 9.2 million horses in the United States, probably more now since this was done in 2005. And we have approximately 4.6 million people that are involved in the horse industry, not including spectators that attend horse shows and other things like that. Um, so this, as you can see, that we really have a large number of not only horses, but also clientele that need services such as horse boarding operations um, to be offered to them. So many people think that running a horse sporting business is an easy way to make money. They think that it really just goes with feeding horses, providing stalls, providing what care they need, and being able to make easy money. But before diving into any type of new um, equine business or endeavor such as this, um, you need to realize that there's much more to it and you need to know exactly what's involved with it in order to be successful. Um, so some basic facts to consider starting out is that it does require a considerable amount of knowledge and ex experience. Um, you are taking care of a living animal, you're taking responsibility of that animal, and therefore you need to know um, what it takes to uh, responsibly take care of it. Because horses are very different from other livestock species as well as um, other companion animals like dogs and cats that people um, typically have. It's also important that you understand that if you're going to have this business be on your own personal property, um, that there may be a result, it may result in a loss of privacy on the farm. Um, you also need to be able to deal with a variety of personalities. Um, horse people in general can be different. I'm a horse person, but I still feel comfortable being able to say that. Um, and so you need to be able to deal with people that have different opinions about how you care for their horse or are just very particular about um, ways that uh, they interact with you as well as their um, animals. 
It's also important that you look at the liability issues that may be surrounded by having a horse boarding business because this can be a um, major concern. And you also have to expect um, to work 365 days a year because even if you're on leave and you have people taking care of the facility, um, you still have to be a phone call away in case there is um, a problem going on at the farm. So once you consider those things, you really need to decide whether or not there is a need within your own community for another horse boarding facility. Um, you need to know your market and you need to do your research to try to figure this out. So one of the first things that you can do is you can look at the current horse population, not only in your state, but also in the county or city that you may reside in. This information by state is available through the American Horse Council survey that was done in 2005. And in addition, there are other state agencies, for example, here in Maryland, we have the Maryland Horse Industry Board that is under our Maryland Department of Agriculture, and they do studies every few years, economic impact studies, um, which also break down the numbers based off of counties by population. You can also find out what the current horse population is and what's going on within the horse industry um, through word of mouth um, by talking to local fee feed dealers, um, other boarding operations, um, horse owners, and other industry people. The next thing that you need to do to determine whether or not there is a need for a boarding facility is to look at the current boarding facilities or operations and the spaces occupied in the community or area that you're interested in um, opening that facility in. Again, here in Maryland and other states have it, um, we actually have a licensed boarding stable program through the Maryland Horse Industry Board. So we have a licensed boarding list by county in which you can look and see all of the different um, boarding operations that may be within that specific area. You can also look into the yellow pages um, as well as uh, local horsey type publications to see um, what else might be being offered within your state or your community. And then finally, it's important that you also look at the demand in the area and the growth potential of the industry or the area that you're in, that specific niche within the market that you're interested in going into. Um, you can seek this information by looking at the changing population, the land use within your community, as well as the income levels. Other major changes or shifts within the community, for example, if um, there's a military base located there and there's going to be a big push of them having a large number of military people being based out of there in the next few years, that is a, an example of a population change in which you can see there may be more of a demand um, as you are moving forward to try to figure out whether or not that business will work. So once you've done your research of the market and you identify that there's a need, there are lots of different things that you need to consider and know that there's much more to it than just cleaning stalls and feeding horses. A lot of this will depend on how big your operation is, how small your or how small your operation is, and whether or not you are really running a real business. For tonight's talk, we are going to discuss the basics of what needs to be considered. Um, please, please keep in mind that as we go through um, each of the topics, um, I believe each of the topics could warrant a webinar solely on itself. For example, insurance and liability issues, or bu making budgets, or looking at um, building and facility design. So we are going to um, talk about each of them, and maybe not in as great of detail as you'd hope, but I'm also going to, my hope is that I can provide you with the resources that you need and answer some of your questions that at least help get you started. So when we think about a boarding facility, um, there's a lot involved. As you can see here on the screen, it's the daily care of horses, looking at your pasture management, um, the maintenance of buildings, facilities, and equipment, customer service, managing the people that work underneath of you, um, accounting and payroll, uh, marketing, I mean, there's just a number of things in which you have to consider.
once you know that there's a need, you've identified that you really could have a boarding business and hopefully get clientele in there, in your community or in your area, and you kind of have an idea of the basics of what's involved, you really need to then ask yourself, are you really prepared? The first question I like to ask myself, or you could ask yourself, is what do you really want to do with this? You need to be honest with yourself and answer, is what you, you're wanting to do is really to offset the cost of keeping your own horses, or to be able to have people at your facility so you have people to ride with? Or are you really wanting um, to make a profit and to have a real business? If you do want a real business, then you need to then ask yourself, what are the goals for this business? What kind of profit do you want to make? And what needs to happen to make sure that these goals are accomplished? And that's where you can set up objectives or specific goals that you may want to meet specific to your individual business that you want to create. The third thing you need to do in asking whether or not you're prepared is to define what is success to you. Success to some people could mean making a certain amount or a certain salary each year. Um, it could mean offsetting the cost of keeping their own animals. It's really unique to your to you as an individual and to the individual operation that you're trying to create. So if you're really serious about making this into a business, then you need a plan. Um, plans allow you to look ahead, to plan ahead, and to estimate potential expenses. A good business plan is basically a document that summarizes the operational and financial objectives of a business and contains the detailed plans and budgets showing how the objectives are to be realized. This planning allows you to focus on your expectations and develop a program to make them happen. It also makes you think about what problems might arise in the future. For example, what are those unexpected expenses that you might have to consider? And it's really meant to make you think about the bigger picture of the business um, as you are planning so that you can be successful. So there are several items to think about with a business plan. And there's kind of 10 areas and that's where, where, what we are going to touch upon um, in the webinar this evening. The first is what services are going to be offered. Um, are you going to solely be a boarding facility or are you going to offer additional services? Um, the second is your marketing plan. How are you going to get the word out that you're a new business and people can come and be a part of the services that you can offer? You must also think about your customer service because the horse and the people are the clients that you're trying to serve and you need to keep them happy. You also need to consider what resources are needed, not only from the facility standpoint, but also from the clientele as far as riding facilities and other amenities that they might want available. And then you also have to consider um, safety concerns. And this is where having experience with horses can really come in um, to be handy. You know, for example, if you have a horse that just isn't acting right, they're not normal, they're lethargic standing in the corner, you know, maybe they're showing symptoms of that they're having a mild colic. Well, by having experience with horses and knowing, a, being able to identify those symptoms, it can really help you um, and identify a, a potentially dangerous situation. It's also important with that that you also establish barn rules. The sixth part the sixth part of the business plan is looking at nutrition and feeding requirements. Um, then you must also consider the health program and how you want to have that set up. Um, the biggie that I look at is having good contracts and agreements. Because if you have good paperwork to start with, it can really save you from having a bigger, situ bigger problem if a situation were to arise. You also want to look at the finances as well as the legal and risk issues um, and what type of insurance type policies you may um, want to consider as part of your business. So 
Now we're going to go into each part of the business plan and kind of discuss them in more detail. And again, as you have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat um, if you do have anything. So first you need to identify what services you're going to offer. And this should be based on the needs of the local market. Um, you need to consider whether or not you're going to offer pasture board, which is typically um, a pasture with a fresh water source and normally some type of shelter for the horse to have, um, and or are you going to offer stall board, in which you typically offer a stall that would be cleaned daily. It also includes feed, um, turnout time, hay, and either one of these options can also be done as full care or self-care. The next thing you have to do is really think outside of the box. I hate to say it, but here's the reality check of this webinar. Boarding horses has a very small profit um, margin. And so you really have to think out of the box of what additional services you can offer at the facility so that they can be extra sources of income. The more services you offer, the higher the boarding fee and or the additional extra charges you can add on to their boarding fee um, on a monthly basis. So some of these include extra benefits such as vet care, um, grooming, holding a holding fee for the farrier vet each time they come out because that does take your time. Um, taking care of a sick or hurt animal, so if a horse has a laceration and needs daily care, wound care and bandaging, that's something you could offer. Blanketing, clipping, tack cleaning. Um, uh, other additional services, um, and these are in addition to just the care of the horse, can include offering riding lessons, having different riding facilities, so you might have an indoor arena, which um, is of benefit to people who want to ride in the wintertime. Um, you could also offer horse training, breeding services, the list goes on and on um, with real unique things such as field trips, birthday parties, or even lecture series. I know one of the local barns here in um, Maryland actually did a lecture series once a month during um, the winter months um, for their adult women within the barn um, and they did it on topics that they were very interested in learning about. So I want to take this time now to ask you guys, are there any other additions to think of um, that aren't currently on my list? If you'd like to enter them in the chat, that would be great. So one of the additional services we have are hay rides. Looks like lots of people are typing. <laughs> Driving lessons, other farm activities such as pumpkin patches, you pick berries, so other like agritourism type things if you have a lot of property um, and can do that. Clinics, that's a good idea. I didn't even put that on my list. Um, and Carol did point out a good, uh, a helpful suggestion in that when you're looking at what additional services and activities you're going to offer, you also have to consider what does your insurance cover. Okay, so um, you can keep putting those in and, and we'll get back to those in a while, but we're going to move on with our next part of our business plan. The second part of our business plan includes a marketing plan. Um, and any successful marketing plan will help you to maximize your revenue. Um, studies have shown that boarding facilities average an 80% occupancy rate with clients changing facilities once a year. So it's very important for um, horse owners to know about your facilities and the great services that you can offer. And the only way that they can do that is if you have a good marketing plan. The first thing to consider for your marketing plan is looking at location, location, location. Um, you need to decide on the location of your business and it should be something that is um, easy to find or easy to locate and near the population that you are going to draw new clientele from. 
It's also then important to decide what methods you're going to use as part of your marketing plan to get your business out to the public. Some of these techniques can include a logo or sign, and I find it's important that your logo or sign kind of has an indication of what you offer. So if you're not just a boarding facility and you offer other programs or training for specific breeds, you can see from these logos that are listed here, um, for example, the re Retired Racehorse Training Project. You can see from left to right, it starts out as a racehorse, and then they retrain these racehorses into being dressage horses and potentially being able to jump. Or you can see from the Hard Rock sign logo um, that these people probably more than likely train some type of gated horses. I can tell you, as they're a farm that I've been personally um, related to, they train Tennessee walking horses. Other things that you might want to consider are business cards, a website. We know that, I mean, we're doing a webinar now. We know internet is just where everyone goes to find information. And you can create very simple websites for not very much money. Um, you, all, you also might consider um, advertising in local publications, doing some type of open house to invite the community into your facility so that they can see what it's about, um, as well as maybe putting flyers up in local community buildings or um, at feed stores or other things like that. The thing to remember is that um, any of these marketing plans or techniques that you utilize are going to cost you some money. So those are things that you need to remember to put in your budget when you're looking at your overall expenses for running your horse boarding facility. So part three of our business plan includes customer service. Your facility should make, an, make a favorable impression on the clients um, that you're working with. It's important that you create a business like atmosphere and that clients, because clients are what keeps your business running. You need to remember that your um, clients are the, peop are the people and the horses. So you need to not only treat the people with respect, but you also need to take good care of their animals that they are paying you to take care of. It's important that you be ready, as I said before, to deal with multiple personalities. It's also important that you have communication with them and that it's oral communication. Um, this can be in the form of via telephone or in person. Um, or it could be as simple as you leaving notes if necessary if there are things that maybe weren't happening that they need to start remembering as part of barn rules, for example. It's also important as the um, manager or as the owner of the boarding facility that you're available and that you have additional staff as needed if you can't physically be there or if you're out of town to deal with situations. However, it's also important for you not to set boundaries and to not be available, you know, at, at all hours of the day, um, just for them to ask simple questions. You cannot be all things to all people and you really cannot be available 24 hours a day just to answer simple questions, more so only for emergency purposes. Part four of our business plan is to identify what resources are needed. As I've said before, this not only includes the facilities, but it also includes what are the customer's needs and what extra amenities as part of your facility are you going to need um, to offer. Because our customers need, or your customers are going to need to feel comfortable and satisfied um, with where they are keeping their horses. If you already have a property and or buildings available, when you think about our fencing, our pastures, our facilities, and things like that, you need to look at what you currently have and evaluate them to make sure that they are safe for the horses and that it's meeting the needs of what um, your customers may be interested in having as part of their facility. So for fencing, just a brief overview, it should be a safe type of fencing, um, sturdy, visible, durable, at least four and a half to five feet high. Um, there should be no sharp edges, narrow corners, or projections. You also need to consider the initial cost if you don't already currently have it on your facility. 
as well as um, any maintenance that you may need to have from horses kicking down the fence or just from you know general wear and tear um, of wood rotting or, or other things like that. Um, it's also important that when you look at fencing that you also consider whether or not what is the purpose of that fencing. Is it perimeter fencing or interior fencing? And could you get away with maybe having a more sturdy fencing such as um, your wood three or four board fencing on the outside and then utilizing something as like electric tape fencing to fence off certain areas on the inside. Types of fencing to consider for horses. Um, uh, typical ones we see include the wood board fencing on the bottom left, uh, the plastic PVC fencing on the top right, and or the V-wire mesh fencing with the top board um, on the bottom right. And it's very important if you are going to use that type of fencing that you use the V-wire mesh as it has smaller openings, um, not allowing the horses to get their feet caught in the openings, and it also has the board on top so that it is highly visible for the animals to be able to see. When thinking about the pasture, some simple things to consider are your stocking rates. Um, it's suggested that you allow two to three acres per horse, but ideally um, no less than one to two acres per horse, especially if you're counting on that grass to meet any of the nutritional needs of um, the horses that you have pastured there. You may also look into possibly having a sacrifice lot or a dry lot is what it's also called. And this basically consists of a small dirt area where horses can be kept um, when they're not on pasture or not in the barn. But it's allowing them to have um, time out for exercise or other purposes. You may also consider a rotational grazing system. And this is especially good for farms that have small acreage. Um, this is where the land is split into smaller paddocks and the animals are kept on each area for a shorter amount of time till they graze down um, those forages to say three inches and then they're rotated on to the next, um, to the next pasture. And then other management considerations include to avoid over or under grazing, to do soil tests and fertilize and lime as needed, to also identify any weeds and poisonous plants, and to choose a plant species that will grow well in your region so that you do have forages available for the animals that you are boarding at your facility. When you think about facilities or building structures, um, this can really be dependent on what type of board you're offering. If you're offering pasture board, um, you may need different, shell different facility requirements than if you are um, doing stall, stall boarding. It's also important to consider what your county regulations may be on shelter requirements. For example, here in Maryland, we have some counties that require if horses are kept out on pasture that they have some type of um, run-in shed or some type of shelter that they can go into in inclement weather. If um, you're looking at run-in sheds, it's typically suggested that you have 90 to 150 square feet per animal and the typical stall size for horses is 12 feet by 12 feet. Other things to consider with facilities include your flooring um, because this can affect the cleanliness of your facility. Stalls could have rubber mats, you could utilize um, sawdust and shavings in the stalls to also um, help with some of the cleanliness and to make the animals more comfortable. You also want to consider ventilation because it's important for your horses and clients to be comfortable um, and there needs to be good airflow through the barn. So if you're building a new barn or a new facility, um, you need to consider things such as um, placement of doors, windows, fans, and other things like that. And then finally, you also want to take a look at what your manure management plan is. Um, typically, there are two options. Um, one, you can set up a composting facility. Um, and the pros to this are that there is no cost to then have it hauled away. And it also creates a new product for you to use on other parts of the facility. The cons to it are that it's daily maintenance and time that has to go into it. Um, and it does take up space on your facilities, so you really have to look at what your facility layout is and whether or not it's worth um, having. 
Um, or you can also have your manure hauled away, which will be an additional cost, but then it'll be, you know, something that you don't really have to deal with on a daily basis. When looking at um, the resources needed, I mentioned it's not only facilities, but it's also your customer needs. So some things to consider as part of your facility can include um, a clean restroom facility in the barn. If it's something, if you have a um, restroom in your house, then that will decrease your privacy um, of people coming in and out. You may also consider having a telephone in case of an emergency and also for people to get to call for information about what services you offer. Um, it's also important that you have space available for talk and equipment. And if there is limited space available, um, you need to be able to tell people how much space they have and make sure that they're not um, taking up too much space where other people may need to store their items. Other things to consider are areas for riding. This can include an outdoor ring, an indoor ring. It could also include um, trails. And if you are going to offer, um, you know, an extra nice outdoor ring or an indoor ring, um, then those are, those are some amenities in which you could consider increasing the price of board. Finally, the other thing to think of is landscaping or the aesthetics of the property. Um, these just add to the overall atmosphere of the facility and increase the appeal to clients, especially if you have new people coming out um, to look for those. So with that said, I was kind of curious to see if you guys have an, any other client needs that we might consider as part of starting up an a, a equine boarding business. If you do, please feel free to go ahead and type them in the chat box. Trailer storage, that's a good one. And that is something that you can also um, charge extra for um, if you do have space available um, and need to find ways to make extra money. Direct access to trails, that can be a biggie for people who like to do trail riding on a regular basis. Washer and dryer facility, I like that one. Cross country courses. Handicapped riding access. It was also mentioned um, when we talked about the um, soil test that your local extension office or USDA office can also help you with that at a lower cost and make sure that you're doing it properly. A round pen, that's also another good amenity to have. So thank you for sharing those um, suggestions. So part five of our business plan looks at safety concerns. Um, safety is key to a successful boarding business, and it's important that you're always aware of what's going on. Um, it's important that you inspect and evaluate things frequently, and that you establish barn rules and post them. Make sure that everyone's on the same page, that they know what those barn rules are, um, so that you can keep order within your facility. Other recommended practices include having safety trainings um, with your employees so that everyone's on the same page and they're doing things in a similar manner. You may also look at the regular maintenance of facilities and equipment. If something is broke, fix it then. Don't wait to fix it later after a problem has occurred. Um, if you have the funding, you may also look at installing fencing around the perimeter of the property in case an animal were to ever get loose. Um, so that you have that as a safety measure. You could also fence off hazardous areas such as ponds, streams, trees, and other things that horses may get themselves into trouble with. And it's also important that you put things away. So store chemicals in secure areas, but also if you use a pitchfork, but you normally keep it in the storage closet, put it away when you're done with it. So it's not one of those extra things out in the aisle way that um, horses could get themselves into. Some common barn rules, these came directly out of the Stable Management Magazine, which is a great magazine if you um, don't currently subscribe to it. It's actually a free magazine you can subscribe to. But they had a great article in August of 2010 looking at common barn rules. Um, some things they suggested included no smoking and making sure that you post signs so that people remember that. Not allowing dogs to come onto the property. 
I know as being horse people, a lot of us are also dog people, um, but dogs can easily chase horses, spook horses and riders, um, snap or bite at other animals and humans, and it can be a bigger liability to you than what you think it, it may be. It's also important that people don't use other people's property, um, so they utilize only the stuff they're supposed to be using. They don't go into someone else's tack closet and take their brush or steal some of their treats to give to their horses. Um, another rule is to close all gates and stall doors. I think the rule of thumb that a lot of us like to think of is if you go through a gate, close it. Or if you see a gate open, close it. <laughs> because that just helps to increase the safety of, you know, if a horse were to get loose that they can't get through. Um, it's also important to respect the hours of the operation. This also it comes into handy if you do live on the property so that um, people know that um, it's not just the barn, it's also your private residence, and that they need to respect that. You can also look at um, children being supervised. Um, different operations do this differently. Um, you could have basic rules such as no running, screaming, or fence climbing, uh, or that children under a certain age have to be supervised by an adult. Um, it's also important that all riders sign a release before riding. Um, and depending on your discipline, you may require them to also wear an ASTM SCI certified helmet. Additional rules may also be that they have to have um, a specific health program, um, uh, which includes vaccines and, and deworming. So the sixth part of our um, business plan is looking at nutritional requirements. Um, feeding programs should be tailored to meet nutritional requirements of each horse. As each horse's nutritional requirements are dependent on their age, breed, size, temperament, the degree of their activity, as well as even changing weather conditions. It's important that you look for common groups of horses um, at your facility and that you can feed them so that you don't have to have different feeds and hays for each horse because that will drive you crazy. Um, and it's something that you need to make sure that you don't let get out of control. I know some facilities offer say two feed options and maybe one or two hay options and then if a boarder wants something very specific then that owner is then responsible for purchasing that additional feed or specific supplement that they want given to that horse. Some management tips when you look at nutrition requirements include establishing and maintaining a feeding schedule, um, feeding several small meals per day, and making sure that you stick to that schedule. Um, when you're looking at uh, your budget, um, horses consume approximately 2 to 2.5% two of their body weight per day in feed and or hay. Um, and it's important to feed horses at at least 50% of their diet being from forages. Um, horses evolved as grazing animals, and it's essential for them to have a high amount of forages within their diet um, for their digestive system to function well. And then as usual, you should also provide a fresh source of water um, for them to have at all times. The seventh part of our um, health of our business plan is a health program. Um, generally, this is the responsibility of the horse owner. But if at least you should do as a horse boarding owner or, or manager is establish an emergency plan of action. You need to have a conversation with the owner and decide what will happen in the case in which there's an emergency and you cannot get a hold of them. Are you allowed to call the vet? And if so, which vet do you call? Other management tips to consider include requiring a health certificate, negative Coggins test, and isolating new horses um, for any new horses coming onto the property. Um, you should also look into having a vaccination program, a deworming program, and making sure that there's good records. All facilities do this different, but it's probably best for you if you establish what you want to do and hold all boarders to that. So whether or not um, you require that the vet do all vaccines for all horses at a specific time of year, or you leave it up to those owners and they have to provide paperwork and proof that they have gotten those vaccines or they have dewormed those horses, and then you have a good record keeping system as part of your business plan to keep track of that. 
Part eight of our business plan includes contracts and agreements. Um, it's so important that you have written contracts and agreements and that you do not um, agree to things orally. Um, it's important to have that documentation. There are free examples online that you can um, download and you can find all different ways to write up different contracts and agreements. But if there's one thing that I suggest that you invest in having a lawyer have legal advice as to um, having input on something as part of your business, this would be one thing that I highly recommend it for. It's going to cost you money um, to start with, but if there ever is an incident um, later on, it probably is going to save you money in the long run. When looking at a boarding agreement, it should include things such as a description of the horse or horses that they're boarding with you, um, what services are included, so is it full board, is it pasture board, is it stall board, is it self-care, all of those different things. Um, it should also include when fees and charges must be paid. So if it's the first of the month, then you may also put in that contract that if it's not paid by the first, that there is a $10 late fee. Um, those are things that you can add into that. You must also list who is responsible for each area of horse care, and that's when that plan of whether or not you do the vaccinations or you do the deworming or they do, when all of those things um, come in to be part of the plan. Um, you also want to include uh, verbiage on the termination of things. So that is where it would outline under what circumstances the agreement may be terminated. So for example, you need to give them 30 days notice of the horse needing to leave. That would be an example. Um, you should also include risk of loss, indicating that it is the responsibility of the horse owner if something happens to the horse. You can also include right of lien, in which cases if the stables are not paid, the bills um, for the horse, that the stable can obtain the right of that horse. Um, now that is dependent on each state and that's you know really one of those things that is really good to seek legal advice on. Um, and then you can also include uh, waiver of liability which waives you and or the business um, from being liable if say a rider were to fall off and um, break their arm. Another thing that you may consider adding is also putting the barn rules as part of your um, boarding contract and having a spot at the bottom where they have to sign so that they really do know what those barn rules are. Because even if you have them posted in the barn, they may never read them. So it's good to have barn rules in multiple places. And by having a good um, contractor agreement as part of your boarding facility, it really will help to make sure that everyone is on the same page. The ninth part of our business plan, nine out of 10, so we're almost there, um, is finances. Finances are really the heart of the business. And that's why it's so important to, it's such an important aspect of helping um, a boarding business to be successful. Um, things to think about are the rates of your services. I, uh, you should be able to identify expenses that you're going to have. Um, you should be able to develop a sample budget um, as something that you can stick to and tweak as needed as things um, as you continue on with your boarding business. Um, as well as having a um, good book bookkeeping system. So, rates of service. First and foremost, you need to figure out how much you're going to charge. Um, this can be dependent on the industry as well as the market demands. I wish I could have given you exact numbers to tell you this is how much it costs to keep one horse and feed it, and this is how you can base your prices off of how, what you should charge. Unfortunately, because we're all from different parts of the country or me, maybe even out of the U.S., um, you know, these prices are going to be dependent on your specific area. Um, for example, you know, up north where we grow hay, our hay cost is much less than what they may pay in Florida, where they only grow very limited types of hay. 
Um, alfalfa, for example, is something they import in a lot. And when you may pay something like, you know, $8 a bale for alfalfa up here, you may pay upwards of $15, $16, $18, $20 dollars a bale um, down in Florida because of them having to haul um, that type of hay down there. You also should make sure that you're pricing things realistically. This is where your research can come in um, to looking at uh, what other facilities are charging and comparing what the prices they're charging um, based on what are they feeding the horses and what extra amenities or facilities um, they are offering uh, to their boarders. And then I also suggest that you use caution when bartering or offering in-kind compensation to employees because it's very important that you do not make too many free arrangements because you could really be making money by having an actual border in that stall um, and occupying that space. So given um, examples that people automatically think about when considering what they need to pay for for boarding horses, um, things that people automatically think about are feed, hay, bedding, potential labor costs, but a lot of times they don't always um, estimate that high enough, um, as well as pasture management costs. Other expenses to think about, because there are a lot more to it than just those five, um, are utilities, insurance, advertising, workman's comp, payroll taxes and benefits. As you can see, the list just goes on and on. Especially if um, you don't already own your property outright, you're also going to have those extra expenses of a mortgage or renting the facility, um, as well as any additional expenses you might look, need to look at if you've built new buildings or new fencing and those payments that you have to make. Once you've identified the potential expenses for your operation, you must then build a budget to see if you can really be successful and make some money at running, uh, at running a boarding business. As I said before, just boarding horses typically does not make large profits by itself. Therefore, it's important that you look at those additional services or benefits that you can offer your clientele um, to make sure that you can be more successful and actually make money at running your boarding business. As I said before, your budget is unique to your operation and location, and the cost of the different um, supplies or feed or other things that you need to take care of those animals um, can be very dependent on your business's location. Once you come up with the budget, it's important that you stick to that budget um, and that you continue researching um, to make sure that you're keeping up with um, the changes and trends within the industry and how that may affect your overall business. There are a couple places that offer um, some example budgets that you can go and look at. Um, one being from Virginia Tech. Um, their farm business management group has put together several budgets, not only on horses, also on other livestock species. Um, but they have budgets on horse boarding um, for full care, horse boarding for self-care. They also have budgets that you can look at for self and home care budgets and whether or not you currently own your land or you're still, um, you know, making payments on it. Um, and they even have neat budgets for putting up different types of fencing. Um, now, it's important to remember that these budgets and some of the costs that they have put in there are based off of this region or this area um, in the Northeast area and Virginia area. And so as you look at those, it's important that you take that research that you've had and if you say, well, they're saying an average cost of hay is $5 a bale, but say you're feeding alfalfa, um, then you're gonna need to plug into that Excel sheet, um, you know, that higher cost for that hay that you might be feeding. Penn State University also has another um, great resource um, through their Agriculture Alternatives Fact Sheet series. And at the end of this publication, it also has a sample budget um, that you can utilize to at least get you started and thinking about, about this. 
Um, the Virginia Tech budgets are something that have been around for a while, but they've recently updated them as of May 2011, so they should be very current and helpful as something for you to use as a tool. As I said, the other thing with finances is having a good bookkeeping system. It's important that you record every transaction and anything that you do with money gets put down, gets recorded in, in any way that you can think of doing it. Depending on what um, type of business entity you are, several of the expenses may be tax deductible, so it's important that you keep track of them. Um, it's also important that you take time to categorize each transaction and that you track the income and expenses that are occurring within the business. Having good records of what's actually going on in your business will tell you, one, when you've made a profit, two, um, it helps you to manage yourself more efficiently, especially if you reevaluate the financial situation often. It also helps you to um, comply with state and local government regulations. And let's face it, it's something that the IRS is really going to hold you to if you are truly an equine business. If this is an area that you're not comfortable with, this is um, another expense that you might look at is hiring an accountant to take care of um, your bookkeeping and your tax uh, needs. The final part of um, our business plan is looking at legal and risk issues. These can include um, insurance, licensing, the form of business entity you decide to be, as well as the environmental and zoning regulations. And this is really where you could get into trouble. So it's important that you keep up with, um, with these areas. The first thing to consider is insurance. And when you're looking at what type of insurance policy you might need, um, you can consider several things. The first would be the financial stability of your business. Um, you can also look at the value of the horses if you're going to take out individual horse policies. You should also look at the level of risk and the activities that you are going to have going on at the facility, um, your level of personal involvement, and whether or not you really need to um, protect yourself um, from your personal assets not being touched um, if there were an incident, as well as looking at the likelihood of experiencing a covered loss while insured. By doing so, this will help you to anticipate all potential um, situations in which the horses or business may be at risk. And it really helps you to, it's just part of that bigger picture of what you're trying to look at when putting together a successful business. There are several different types of insurance policies you can consider. Um, and again, like I said, this could be a whole webinar in itself. Um, but first and foremost is to look at commercial liability. Um, this is what will cover um, all horse-related activities, including riding lessons, horse shows, clinics, meetings, um, and actions resulting in any property damage um, or injuries to a third person. I have to tell you, um, if you're running a business on your own property, a lot of times people think things like this are covered under their home insurance. But if it's a real business, I'm sorry to tell you, more, more than likely it's not. The other mistake that people also make when it comes to commercial liability insurance is that um, a lot of times they think that if they have people sign a written release holding the operation harmless, um, they think that that is, will protect them. But unfortunately, those releases don't always stand up in cases of negligence. The third mistake people make with liability is some of our states actually have uh, equine activity laws, and they think, oh, well, then I'm protected. Well, these laws really only help um, in limited, in, to limit or control liabilities, not to have zero liability laws. They're not zero liability laws. So they are only going to protect you to a certain extent. Other things to consider are property insurance, um, fire and theft, care, custody, and control policies. Um, this is where, um, if you already have liability insurance, you may also take this out, and it would help you um, in the case that, it, say a horse, say a boarded horse got off 
or got out of the property, um, out to the road, and a car hit it. Well, your liability insurance would help cover um, the damage to the car, the, the injuries to the person that um, are riding in the car, but it's not going to cover that horse. And so if you have care custody and control, a care custody and control policy, um, then that can help you in the case in which that horse owner may come back and try to sue you because their horse got out. Um, that's an example of when that might help. You should also consider individual horse policies, whether it's for your own horses and depending on what their value is. Um, and then workers' comp insurance is also another option. Um, and as many of you probably know, this covers work-related injuries and lost wages of employees. Um, if something were to happen, it generally is fairly inexpensive and it's probably worth you paying it um, to start with instead of having a big um, fee if something were to happen with one of your employees on um, the job. Other things to consider um, under this also include if your state requires a licensing to become a board. Uh, Boarding facility here in Maryland, our Maryland Horse Industry Board actually inspects and license stables. If you have five or more horses that you're boarding, it's a requirement that you have to go through this. There is an annual fee and basically they inspect the property to make sure um, that the facilities are meeting minimum standards for care of horses as well as they look at the um, how the animals are being cared for and um, what the current animals at that facility look like. You must also consider what kind of business entity you'd like to be, and I could talk for hours about this, but you need to look at um, the different forms of business that you can do. Um, some general ones are sole proprietor, in which it would be one person running the business. You could also have partnerships, and that's in which you may have two, more, two or more people. Um, in some cases, you may have one person that runs the business, but one person that also finances it as a silent partner. And so that would be an instance in which a partnership would be a good way to run that business. Um, and you can also look into becoming a corporation, but becoming a corporation um, does have its benefits, but you also need to seek legal assistance in order to become one. Um, if you are a corporation, typically we see most often the LLC or the limited liability corporations being formed. Um, but by doing so, it helps to separate the business from personal assets. It also um, makes only the operations assets be at risk if something were to happen. And typically you have a lower taxation rate on your income. Um, so if you are a real business and um, this may be something that you want to look into. And then finally, you must also consider environmental and zoning regulations. Um, several counties have zoning ordina ordinances um, based on how you can use the land and how it can be used and what public facilities and amenities are needed to provide to our communities. Um, and they also have restrictions on how many horse, some have restrictions on how many horses you can have on so many acres, you know, those shelter requirements that I referred to before, how you may um, deal with your manure or horse disposal. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's important that you contact your county planning and zoning office to see um, what type of ordinances may be in effect for the area in which you're living. Um, other things that you may look into, I know here in Maryland, um, several of our farms can have soil and water conservation plans um, in which the soil and conservation district um, gives the landowner recommendations on how to make decisions in the prote protection, conservation, and enhancement of our natural resources, um, such as water, soil, animals, and all things that are included in a boarding business. Um, and then also specific here to Maryland, and there may be things like this specific to other states. Um, we, if you meet certain requirements, um, you also have to have a nutrient management plan, um, which is just another piece of paperwork that um, you're going to have to add as part of your business plan. So in conclusion, 
Profits can be low if you're just running a boarding business, but if you can think of those out of the box, unique services, or just services that are needed um, to entice the clientele in your community, you can be successful and you can make money um, as part of offering this equine business endeavor. Um, it is something that requires hard work and dedication, um, and you really need to have a business plan and stick to it. You need to make sure that you have a business mentality and that you reevaluate what you're doing on a monthly basis um, so that you can see where the holes are in the plan that you may have just started out with. Um, it's also important to continually educate yourself I think as horse people, um, that's something that we typically do anyways. Um, and it's important to remember that you're not gonna be successful overnight. Um, this takes years to be successful and to establish a business within the industry. Um, so build yourself slowly, um, start out with the basics and then build on more services and amenities as you see what the needs of your clientele are. Um, we had a, a Local farm, uh, horse boarding farm called Full, Full Moon Farm give a horse boarding talk at our recent expo. And they had a quote that said, um, you know, horse boarding businesses are not necessarily about a good living, but it's a great lifestyle or a good lifestyle. So you might not always make, you know, six figures, but if it's something that you enjoy doing, you can be successful at it if you do have the right type of um, business plan in place and you continually evaluate it to see um, where you're at uh, with your business. So just real quick before we take questions, some helpful resources um, that you may consider looking into. Um, for our equine business management class here at the university, we use um, a book called Complete Guide for Horse um, business success. It's the second edition. Um, it has all kinds of great stuff on the business side of things. Um, and then there's also another great book that I utilize a lot called Horsekeeping on a, on a Small Acreage. Um, and this has a lot of great information specific to facilities and needs of horses. So if you're looking at starting from the ground up, um, or if you have a current facility and need to revamp it, um, that can be a great book for you to look into. Both, I believe, are available through Amazon.com if that's an easy way for you to get to it. Um, and then some other additional resources are the, your Soil Conservation District, um, E-Extension Horses, which has a lot of great um, business resources and other things specific to horses, uh, your local land grant university, um, as well as any of your state agencies, such as a state horse industry board, your department of ag, um, and or your state horse council. So with that said, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Again, um, please utilize the chat box. I know some of you have already asked some, but if you have additional, please feel free to um, go ahead and put them in the chat box. Um, there was a question about whether or not this PowerPoint will be posted. Um, the whole entire webinar will be posted on the My Horse University um, website. For you all to view at any time that you'd like. Can we do have one question from Lisa. It says, what about neighbors, friends, signing liability waivers for riding on the property once you become a business? I think that all comes back to um, what I said earlier about whether or not you have uh, oral agreements versus um, having some type of signed contract or agreement. Um, so if you do have something in place once you become a business and it's something that's easy for them to sign, I would definitely recommend having them do that. Um, even though they are a neighbor or, or a friend, um, it's just part of having a good business practice to have anyone do that, whether or not they're related or 
um, there's someone that you're just providing services to. Any other questions? Uh, Marsha had a question about whether or not a barn manager um, would have insurance as well as um, the property owner. Um, I think depending on how the situation is set up, um, if the property owner just owns the property and then the barn manager is running that business, then yes, they should have their own um, insurance. If it's a partnership, then they would need to discuss, you know, how that insurance is taken out and who would be included on the policy. Um, and then other forms of insurance would also be if you have, say, visiting riding instructors coming onto the property, um, they, they may also have their own ins liability insurance connected to the training and lessons that um, they are providing on your property. We also had a question about um, what about a partnership with a trainer who has clients boarding at your facility and uses your facility for lessons. Um, I would suggest that that trainer has their own insurance um, to deal in situations with their own clientele. Okay, so it looks like maybe we don't have any other questions. I don't see anyone else typing. Um, I did want to let you all know that, go ahead, Amanda. Oh, no, that's okay. I was just going to um, conclude, but if you have something else to say first, then that's fine. No, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, well, I, Kristen, I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation. It seems like everyone um, learned a lot, and uh, again, it will be it was recorded tonight, and we'll post it um, to the myhorseuniversity.com website by the end of the week if anyone wants to review it or suggest it to anyone else. Um, and thanks so much to all of you for your participation and your questions tonight. We um, will probably send you a survey by email in the next few days, and if you could just take a few minutes to give us your feedback, that will certainly help us as we plan future webcasts that will benefit you. Um, and we hope you'll join us for next month's free webcast on the topic of managing live horse events, which is scheduled for March 27th at 7 p.m., and registration for that is online through myhorseuniversity.com. And My Horse University um, also has Facebook and Twitter sites for um, anyone who wants to follow us and get the most up-to-date information on our events, courses, webcasts, and more. Um, and again, thanks everyone, and if you have any um, feedback or follow-up for us, you can reach us at info at myhorseuniversity.com or visit us on our website, and we hope to see you at another webcast.